All right, we've been studying differential calculus for a little while. <clears throat> Most of the time we spent was taking derivatives. Now it's time to spend some time uh, looking at what the derivatives are used for. Um, and again, the whole goal here is analysis. And so what these instructions are trying to do here is to show you which parts we need to look at in order to get a sense of the picture of the graph of these functions. So in the first case, we're just going to take a fourth degree polynomial and uh, find its derivative. First, this is the fourth degree polynomial in function form. There's the first derivative. And then... Um, it says I'm supposed to find and classify stationary points. So stationary points exist when the rate of change is zero meters per second, miles per hour, whatever. So if we want the rate of change to equal zero, that means I want my derivative to equal zero. So f prime of x is here, which is equal to that, equals zero. This has now become an algebra exercise. Since I have a, uh, this equal to zero, I should try factoring. I take out common factors of 12x squared, leaving me with x plus 1. So the two ways to make this equation, the derivative, equal to zero would be for x to equal zero or for x to equal negative 1, because negative 1 plus 1 is zero. Zero times 12 is zero. So that means that on a number line, if I was to look at the graph of this function, I would see a stationary point when x equals negative 1 and a stationary point when x equals zero. So now I'm going to jump down to step three and find the intervals when the function is increasing or decreasing. In other words, if it stopped here and it stopped here, was it going uphill or downhill here, here, and here? So I find a number to the left of negative one, in this case negative two. I evaluate the function, and it turns out to be a negative number. If the derivative is negative here at negative two, then the derivative is going to be negative everywhere to the left of negative one because that's the only time we have zeros here and here. So once negative, always negative to the left of negative 1. It means the function is decreasing during that time, going downhill. Then I look at numbers between 0 and negative 1. I can think of negative 1 half as the easiest one I can think of right now. And that turns out to be a positive number, which means now the function will be increasing after it stops at negative 1. And any x is bigger than 0, we're also increasing again. Usually we expect that if we're going to increase here, then it's going to decrease over here. But in this case, it seems to increase, take a little visit to stop, and then continue increasing along its way. This gives me the ability then to evaluate, uh, or to rather classify, the stationary points, which was the rest of what I needed to do for part i. So the first thing I do is I substitute 0 for x into the original function to find out the location of that stationary point, and it's at negative 2. So 0, negative 2 is a stationary point. And it's also an inflection point based on the fact that we increase, stop, increase. We're changing our concavity. The other stationary point is just purely stationary. In fact, it's going to be a minimum at negative 1, negative 3. And I know it's a minimum because we went downhill we stopped, and then we went uphill, which means this has to be the lowest point in the neighborhood. So it's actually a local minimum, if I was being correct. Increase. The function is increasing when x is from negative 1 to 0 or from 0 to infinity. So this interval plus and this interval, but not 0 itself. And the function is decreasing from negative infinity to negative 1. So that's the uh, the full write-up of what I can do with the first derivative. I can find the stationary points and classify them and determine when the function is going uphill or downhill. Now for the second derivative. We have the first derivative is 12x cubed plus 12x squared. The second derivative then is going to be 36x squared plus 24x. And to make the second derivative equal to 0, we need, the sec we need 36x squared plus 24x to equal 0. Take out a common factor, show it a good time. And here I can see when x is negative 2 thirds or when x is 0, we're going to have a 0 product. So we already found out that when x equals 0, we have a stationary point. Now I've proved that it's a stationary inflection point because both uh, f prime of 0 and f double prime of 0 both equal 0, which means the, fun the function stops at that point and changes concavity at that point. It's 2 and 1. All right, so um, I found x equals negative 2 thirds would be the other point, and so I'm going to evaluate in the original function, mind you, the value of f of negative 2 thirds so I can see the location. Where exactly is that inflection point going to be located? It turns out to be around negative 2 and a half. So this is the thing I learned from the second derivative, is uh, that's the other inflection point. Moreover, I'm going to evaluate the second derivative at negative 1. 
to the left of my inflection point to ensure that the concavity is correct. It should be concave up or scooping upwards for all x's to the left of negative two-thirds. And then when x is between negative two-thirds and zero, we're concave down. And when x is bigger than zero, we're back to concave up again. So there is inflection after zero. And we can come over here and say the function is concave up here. Function is concave down here. And that's it. So that's the analysis, all the analysis that we need. We've got inflection, concavity, stationary points, increase, decrease. And if we knew all of those things, we would have a lot of information, more than you actually realize. Let's put all the pieces together. We have one stationary inflection point. We have one minimum point. We have one inflection point. And it turns out we also have a y-intercept because that's that stationary inflection point. Now, the only way to make this work, we have to go down. That's decreasing. Concave up. That's true. Then we have to be increasing and concave up still. Then at negative two-thirds, we're still increasing, but now we're concave down. We stop at zero, negative two, so we should have a horizontal tangent line right there. And then we continue increasing after that and concave up. So all of the things that we learned in the previous slides, they exist here. I label my key points. And I make sure that the technology backs it up. I can see this is a pretty solid graph. It looks almost exactly like the computer's one. So I feel really good about this. All right, straight up a cubic polynomial. Take the first derivative. Take the second derivative. Set the first derivative equal to 0. And that gives us a factorable quadratic expression. So there's two places where the first derivative equals 0. That means two stationary points. Take the derivative, or sorry, evaluate at those two points. And I see 4, negative 79, and negative 2, 29. Those two points, then, and notice again, I had to go back to the original function to get the locations of my stationary points. But it should be pretty clear that this is going to be a local minimum and this is going to be a local maximum because this is lower than that is. This is a small negative or large negative number, a small positive number. So um, I know I, what my intervals of increase and decrease are going to be based on my understanding of cubic polynomials coupled with my understanding that we have um, local minimum and maximum here. Now, I should write down my intervals of increase and decrease, but I'm not doing that here for the interest of time. Um, when we let the, uh, well, so, oh yeah, so finally we take the second derivative, set it equal to zero, we get x equals one, we put that back into the original function to find out the location, and all of these points should actually be in, in you know, conjunction with one another. I know the y-intercept is zero, one, I know there's an inflection point here which should be lower, and then this minimum point should be lower than negative 25, which it is. So um, all of these points should line up and match with each other. If I claim that this point was the minimum and then I find my inflection point to be lower than that, then I know I'm, de I'm definitely wrong. Anyway, we wouldn't do any of this without checking with technology. And so there is the technology confirming everything that I found analytically. That's really the money shot right there. So uh, finally, just real quick. You won't always get derivatives that have uh, zeros. So that is to say there might be functions that don't stop. They always increase or they always decrease. I find that out in this example uh, because uh, when I convert the function into power form and take the first and second derivative, I notice that the numerators are constant. And I can't get 2 divided by a number to ever equal 0. In other words, there's always going to be something to divide. There will never be 0 to divide. Um, so we can just sit here and say 2 over the square root of x has no zeros. Therefore, there are no stationary points. Taking the second derivative, we end up with this conclusion um, that we can't have a 0 second derivative either, which means there are no inflection points. But more importantly, um, what I learned from this is the function is always increasing at a decreasing rate because the first derivative is always positive and the second derivative is always negative. So we should have something that arcs downwards, like taking your left hand and uh, hooking your palm so that it looks like an arc. That's what's supposed to happen. Now, given the fact that I can evaluate f for 1 and 4 very easily, I can do that in my head, I state those two points and make two points so that I know where my graph is supposed to be. And now I know my function has to always increase and it has to go through those two points and it's going to increase at a decreasing rate. So all of the qualifications are met here. I simply go to the technology and verify that the graph is the same as what I predicted it would be. Hope you find that helpful. Have a great day.